community members, Guru Mawuk, Public Works Director. Um, <clears throat> we are going to be talking about another Glen Loma Ranch specific uh, plan project, 10th Street Bridge. <laughs> Well, we'll make it short and sweet as, as much as we can. Um, I'll just do a quick introduction of this item, and then I'll turn it over to our city engineer, Gary Heap, uh, who will walk you through the presentation. We are presenting to you um, potential scope modification options for this project <clears throat> for any uh, potential cost savings. Uh, just to be clear, staff um, is appreciative of count prior council directions to build this project with as many uh, elements and components to accommodate as many road users as possible. So I just want to be clear that the staff's position is the project design as presented at the 65% plants is a good design. However, as we have been discussed, there are uh, funding limitations and um, cost saving measures that the council is considering. And one of those is to look at maybe uh, some design modification options. Uh, which will be presented to you this evening. I want to make four quick points before I turn it over to Gary. Uh, number one, in the past, uh, council, this council and former councils have heard about this project through study sessions in 2016 as part of a budget uh, uh, exercise, 2017 uh, September as a, st a standalone study session to see whether or not um, the city should proceed with this project, period. Uh, in August 2019, you heard this about this project about uh, based on um, the funding needs for this project as well as the fire stations um, and the sports park projects. To give you an overview of uh, Glen Loma uh, developer contributions for this project, there are um, specific contributions tied to the project with respect to the parks and the fire station, as well as um, TIF fees, the developer having to pay TIF fees as any developer would, and also the developer having to build a bridge uh, once the city completes the design. The fourth item I want to make is the TIF estimate. Estimate for this project was close to six million before we did an update uh, in July 2019. In July 2019, the estimate for this project was modified to 17.6 million based on the latest. I say that number again. In the TIF worksheet, in the traffic impact fee fund uh, update that we did back in July, we updated the numbers not only for this project, for the transportation system in the city. So uh, the, the original, uh, when this project was conceived, estimate was 6 million in the TIF. That got um, updated to 17.6 million based on available information now. So I just wanted to, to put that out there. With that, I'll turn it over to Gary Heap. Thank you, Groom. Uh, again, my name is Gary Heap. I'm the uh, city engineer, and I have this presentation for you this evening. Uh, a lot to go through, so I'll get right into it. <clears throat> I'm going to go through a number of uh, topics this evening on this uh, 10th Street Bridge, including some background information, uh, project costs and where we are at to date today, uh, talking about the different scope modifications of six specific uh, projects uh, within the 10th Street Bridge project itself, talk about the alternatives for each of those, and then come to a conclusion, and then we can talk about each of those specific options as we go along. Um, the staff report was very extensive uh, and it had a lot of information in it, uh, so hopefully you had a chance to look at it and the different alternatives and, and uh, we can discuss those as we go through or at the end of the pro project uh, presentation, whatever you uh, desire. Um, so basically some background, uh, the project itself is, is really to build a bridge over the Ubis Creek uh, connecting 10th Street. That's the project itself is the bridge, uh, but there's a lot of additional components to it. Uh, the, the project itself has been within the general plan uh, since 1978, uh, and it would be a major east-west connection uh, within our arterial network system uh, connecting the US 101 uh, network to the Santa Teresa uh, Expressway network uh, on, the, on the west side. Uh, it would also provide access to the Glen Lowen Fire Station, as we just spent a lot of time talking about. Uh, this is the specific project area here, as you see. Uh, within the Glen Loma area. Uh, 
And this is a more detailed uh, review of the project uh, scope itself. And you see it's a, it's a pretty long and extensive uh, project area. This, if you can look at the screen here, is the bridge itself. Uh, and it's a small portion of the actual scope you see because the scope of the project as designed extends all the way uh, to the to over to this end over here uh, and it includes multiple roundabouts drop-offs uh, ancillary bridges and so it's the project itself is not just a bridge as the the name itself uh, defines Again, the scope of the project is uh, the 10th Street Bridge to ultimately uh, build a bridge that was originally designed to carry four lanes of traffic, two lanes in each direction, with bike lanes and wide sidewalks. Uh, the pedestrian traffic and safety improvements for Gilroy High School uh, are also included uh, and have two drop-off zones, one between Uvis and Orchard, one between Orchard and Prince Val that we'll talk about in just a minute. Uh, pavement and striping improvements along 10th Street, two roundabouts, one at Orchard and 10th and one at 10th and Uvis, and then a water line project within uh, 10th Street as well. So this is actually a, a rendering of the bridge itself. This is, it's a pretty long bridge. Uh, this shows the full width with a 16 foot landscape median, which matches the landscape median on the west side in the Glen Loma area. You also see a, an image here of what we're gonna be calling and talking about is the Breezeway Bridge, which has an eight foot clearance for pedestrian and bicycles, and also the roundabout here at Uvis and 10th. Uh, that was another design option uh, that we'll be talking about here. The project costs, this is the big number, 27 million. Uh, this is where we're at today. Uh, what, what is that 27 million in Compass? 21 million uh, is the current estimate for the bridge itself and all the ancillary uh, materials and project uh, portions or, or, or different components. Uh, the design cost of 2.1 million, uh, is actually estimated at $4 million, but uh, the current project that we have um, scoped out with the contractor is for $2.1 million. Environmental studies, $200,000 to date, although you see the note below, and it, as with identified in the staff report, if we do go with additional uh, federal uh, NEPA clearance, as we feel we should, that's going to add another quarter million dollars to the project. Uh, utility relocations, a quarter million. Construction management and inspection costs could be upward of two million. Mitigation and monitoring and plan establishment within the creek uh, or the channel could be upwards of a million. And then property acquisition, we're assuming zero at this point. Assuming that if we do uh, any work along the levee, if we're doing any work along the school frontage, uh, that we're gonna be good neighbors and working with the school district and they are gonna be dedicating any roadway uh, right away to us at no cost. If there is additional right away need uh, with the orchard right away uh, needs for the roundabout, if we decide to go to that direction, there's gonna be right away costs. So that has not been factored in with this value here. So the price could actually go up. So we're at 27 million today. So here's the different scope modification options we're gonna be talking about this evening. Uh, revising the bridge width from a 76 foot width, which it is currently today, to a 64 foot width by reducing the median from 16 foot to four foot. Removing the breezeway bridge as an option. Replacing the roundabout at Uvis Park Drive with an at grade stop controlled T intersection as an option. Removing the Gilroy High School student drop off between Uvis and Drive and Orchard, which is one of the two uh, drop-offs in front of Gilroy High School, and this is the, the minor drop-off or the, the less significant drop-off. The major drop-off or the more significant drop-off is the drop-off in front of the high school between Orchard and Prince Val, as we'll see in a little bit. And then lastly, replacing the roundabout at Orchard with an at-grade signalized intersection or its alternative. So getting into the details, looking at the first option here for discussion, option number one, reducing the width of the bridge from 76 feet to 64 feet by reducing the median width to 12 feet. Again, uh, this right here, the 12 foot uh, is, was thought or put in to in the future accommodate four lanes of traffic. Uh, in the future, uh, we don't feel that there's a need to actually do that. So 
looking at, and the way we've set this up in the presentation, it follows the staff report. We're going to be looking at the pros and the cons for each and then providing the staff recommendation and the BPAC recommendation. We did take this presentation to the BPAC last week at a special meeting and they did provide their recommendations that we'll be sharing with you this evening as part of the staff report as well. So in terms of option one, uh, the reduction of the width from 76 feet uh, to 64 feet, it should be noted that with that reduction we are still going to have um, uh, a four foot median, we're still going to have uh, two class, uh, two buffered bike lanes and eight foot wide sidewalk on that bridge. This is approximately a million dollars worth of savings overall for this narrowed bridge. The pros itself, uh, re the reduced bridge width, uh, we see as a positive that it won't really affect the use of the bridge. Um, less impacts to the channel, the habitat, and the vegetation under the bridge. Um, we have reached out to Hexagon and we've looked, asked them to do an analysis and to look into their model. Um, they've basically confirmed to us that there's no need for a four-lane bridge. That the look, looking at the general plan build out as it currently stands, as it projects into the future, looking at the build out of Glen Loma, there will never be a need for a four-lane configuration of the bridge or four lanes on 10th Street, either east or west of the bridge. So building it at two lanes will meet today's need and the future need of 10th Street, uh, again, into the future. Just so that I'm clear, yes. Orig the original scope was accounting for four lanes, Correct. two in each direction. Correct, into the future. And under yes. option one, we're going one lane in each direction. We would build it at a narrower, which, which would not in the future accommodate four lanes. It would only accommodate two lanes. Yes, so we would, be one in each direction. we would be reducing it to only be able to accommodate two lanes. One, one in, in each direction, direction, and then we've foregone the possibility of a later expanding a late, of a later expansion because there's no need for that expansion into the future okay. according to uh, our traffic uh, so traffic under option one we've reduced it from four lanes down to two lanes plus we shrunk the uh, center divide we the median the design itself with a 76 foot design is a two lane with a wide median right. that wide median in the future could be Re redesigned or restriped. You would what you would do is you would take the the median and the two lanes, restripe it to make four lanes, four narrow lanes. Instead of two wide lanes and a wide median, you would restripe that and reconfigure that to make four narrow lanes of traffic, while maintaining the buffer bike lane and the wide sidewalk. It would just still be done within the curb to curb of the bridge width the f wide bridge width okay. by using the excess or the extra width within the 16 foot median. But under the original plan, it was to have? Was only to have two lanes of traffic, one in each direction with an extra wide median. Oh, so the, under so, the original plan, there wasn't going to be two lanes no, constructed. But it allowed for a future, a future, a future four lane configuration Got with it. the use of the 16 foot and using that extra width to add okay. the lanes. Got it. Okay. So, so the proposal is to go from 76 to 64, taking that 16 foot median, reducing it to a four foot standard median, which would not allow for a for a four lane configuration in the future. Okay. Um, it, uh, another pro would be the the fact that again, if we were to, to use go to a four lane configuration, there's some impacts that it would have on the Glen Loma side. Uh, it would require additional right away on the Glen Loma side to widen to four lanes, and we'd also have to widen the two existing roundabouts in the Glen Loma area. So again, there's going to a four lane configuration would have not only significant impacts on the east side in the residential neighborhood in front of the high school, but also on the west side within the existing Glen Loma area, requiring widening of that portion of the roadway, but also the existing roundabouts. And so would we have to do that now? It would be, have to be done into the future if we were to go to a four-lane configuration with the bridge. Right, right, right. So we, knowing that we could go to a four-lane, we have the ability to go to a four-lane. We would. And a future engineer, future city council could decide, okay, now's the time we want to go to a four-lane, which means we would have to widen or redesign the, the Roundabout. Going to a four-lane configuration on the bridge would require four-lane configuration within Glen Loma, which would require right-of-way take and reconfiguration of the roundabouts. Is is the land there at the Glen Loma 
It is not. It would require right away take. But okay, but but it's not there currently. It's not currently there. It's not available it's for. Not available there. It would require right away acquisition, because it's not designed for four lanes. It's only designed for two lanes on the Glen right. Lomond side. Right. But that I guess what I'm asking is that excess land, is it is it there? Not, not on that the, we. Not on the Glen Lomond side. So if it's not there, and it's going to require taking. I mean, I, I guess what you're saying it would require some sort of eminent domain then? Or some kind of purchase of property or some kind of uh, acquisition of some kind. Again, eminent domain is one way to acquire property. Right. Uh, it could be done through negotiations. Right. Okay, please continue. Mm -hmm. um, I believe, yes, it would require reconstruction of the two existing roundabouts, yes. So those are the pros right there. Um, in terms of the cons, um, narrow bridge median won't match the new roadway in the median on the west side of Glen Loma. There's currently a wide median on the west side, so we'd have to adjust uh, the, the medians to match. Reduction of the bridge width would require the modification of the existing 65% bridge design because it's currently designed at the 76% or 76 foot width, so we would have to have the designer modify the design, uh, and it would again make future widening more difficult. I think that's clear. So in terms of the staff recommendation, we are recommending uh, to build a narrower bridge when we presented it to the BPAC. They also supported staff's recommendation to build the narrower bridge. So that's option one. Would you like me to continue with option two? Can Please I go through continue. the presentation at this point? Yeah. Okay. Option two is a discussion of, on the removal of the U.S. Creek Trail Breezeway Bridge. Uh, this is, uh, again, a rendering showing the Breezeway Bridge itself here. Um, the discussion will be about when the removal of the bridge takes place. Uh, pedestrians are forced to come up and cross here at grade. The pros uh, would be the removal of the bridge would reduce the project cost. The cons would be the elimination, uh, it would eliminate the continuous class one bike path along the levee, would force the trailer users again to cross 10th Street at grade at Uvis Park Drive. Uh, which would be a second mixed-use at grade trail crossing similar to what we now see at Miller uh, Avenue crossing, which we all know is, is uh, an issue that we're continuing, uh, continuously asked to, to look at in terms of making safety improvements. Staff's recommendation uh, was to construct the Breezeway Bridge for safety improvement reasons, uh, and the BPAC's recommendation was to support that uh, staff recommendation as well. If we were to eliminate that, that cost savings would be about $1.4 million. Can you go back to the, the uh, diagram? Yep. So, um, and I don't mean to speak for any new members of the council, but past councils I know never really was all that excited about that breezeway option, um, <clears throat> only because of line of sight, kids in there, um, you know, it, just safety and security um, issues. And so if that option were to go away, then, as you pointed out, then you're eliminating that Class 1 right. trail. Right. And they have to cross at street level. What happens to any traffic on the, on the bridge there? Do they just start to queue up automatically, allowing this traffic? And there's no light, there's no stop sign, there's... None of that stuff, right. right? And that's going to get to the next option where we're going to talk about what to do with the roundabout here and the recommendation for removal of that and putting a stop sign here. Uh, if we were to remove the breezeway bridge, we would have to potentially look at going from stop controlled intersection to a signalized intersection uh, to create a safe pedestrian crossing with a signalized cross crosswalk here, um, which would reduce the cost savings here at the uh, the removal of the roundabout. And has the PD weighed in on any safety concerns that they have regarding that bridge? They're concerned. Well, to be honest, the, um, uh, the BPAC did have concerns about the safety of the bridge itself, uh, the darkness underneath. Uh, we did indicate to them that uh, it would be well lit, uh, that it was actually with the narrowing of the bridge, it was no longer a 76 foot wide. Uh, tunnel it was a 64 foot wide tunnel so it was a little bit narrower so that helped a little bit 
uh, being eight foot tall. Uh, did provide clearance in terms of head height for bicyclists, um, but again, it did provide issues with regards to it being dark. Um, but again, if it was well lit, um, there, there was a discussion at one point about having a skylight here. Um, the removal of this option is a cost savings item. Um, I don't believe the skylight option is a part of the design anymore. That has been taken out for cost savings at this point. Uh, and so um, what we have here is a bridge with, with heavy illumination underneath it, LED illumination. So um, okay. from a safety standpoint there, uh, I believe the PD was okay with that. Yeah, I'm just, uh, you know, of this entire project, this is just one of my concerns is the, the safety and security. I would certainly hate to see young kids walking through there and somebody get attacked or right. something like that. Now, now with the bridge, with this crossing here, we're still going to have and maintain this access here so people can still come uh, up this pathway and cross at the crossing here if they feel uh, that if this is an unsafe crossing. Okay. Mayor, may I ask? Yeah. And, and if that was the option that we decided on, you feel that that would be safe enough for any pedestrians to walk, walk there? with the traffic that it will cause on, on the bridge? If we were to get rid of, rid of the bridge, the bridgeway, are you saying that um, the second option would be to cross over the bridge? Right. Um, you know, and I, I, I understand the concern, and I, I, again, I agree with the concern, but I also worry about what that may cause if people are crossing over the bridge with traffic. Right, and, and what we would, what we'll, you'll see in the third option, which is the removal of the of the roundabout and replacement with the T intersection. If we do decide to go with removal of the breezeway bridge, staff's going to recommend signalizing that intersection to provide a, a pedestrian signalized crossing there, okay. which actually takes away from the cost savings, putting a stop sign in because we'd have to signalize it. And uh, but we would recommend signalizing that. Then you mentioned, and maybe I, I heard incorrectly, but you mentioned that the BPAC had recommended to eliminate the breezeway? To keep the breezeway keep bridge. The breezeway. Okay, I want to make sure, thank you. So I want to clarify, Mr. Mayor, were you saying that uh, you were asking about the safety of kids with the breezeway or without? No, with, with the breezeway. With the breezeway, yeah, questioning it's, the it's safety. A, it's a tunnel. Right, it's yeah. a tunnel. So is that not like what we have going under Santa Teresa Boulevard? I, I mean, am I, I, I don't know what this is. Is that what this was intended to be, like what we have going under Santa Teresa Boulevard? No, it's different. It's different. Okay. How is it different? It's on a tunnel. It goes underneath the bridge. Well, that's kind of what this is. That's, yeah. yeah. So this is a narrow tunnel on dark. Well, we hope that be lit. Yeah, I'm not understanding the so, difference. Gary, can you respond? It, it, uh, to be honest, I'm not familiar with the crossing underneath Santa Teresa. I, I apologize. Okay, because the one under Santa Teresa is also a tunnel. Maybe it's not as long of a tunnel. Is that what we're and saying? It's dangerous, and there's homeless people there, and people feel uncomfortable walking. No, I'm there. just I'm trying to understand the, the the differences. That's all I was asking. Okay. <clears throat> so if I if I may, um, the Santa Teresa bridge is over a waterway, over Uvas Creek, correct? So, so the opening. Yeah. Oh, <clears throat> so the Santa Teresa bridge is over a waterway. It's no, over Uvas Creek. I'm talking about the tunnel. Not, not the bridge that has the cages on it along Santa Teresa. I'm talking the one yes, that goes so underneath the, Santa Teresa Boulevard. Yeah, the, the path goes underneath. Right. Under, and, and I believe it's adjacent to Uvas Creek. Yeah. Okay. It's open, it's open on the other side. But here there is no, it's the, the tunnel feeling comes from it being uh, bound on both sides. So as opposed to it being open, um, Towards, towards the creek side. You're saying the one on Santa Teresa is open on one side? I believe it is. Okay. I've got, walked through there a million times and I've not, it's not open. That's what I thought. Well, that's what I said. I said, so maybe it's just not the same distance, but it is, walls on both sides. Yeah. Okay, I just I stand wanted to corrected. clarify. Okay, thank you. It sounds like it's, it would be similar to that. Right. Well, Except maybe if, if I may add to that, thank you, Councilmember Blankley. Given um, the concerns about safety, um, but knowing now that we have something very similar to that, is there a safety issue with what we currently have? I don't have any information on that with regards to I, I, No, I asked that question because, again, if we're going to talk about safety, let's make sure we understand or we have data that proves that it, it would be unsafe. 
I don't have any data that proves it wouldn't so, be safe. Sometimes there are homeless that camp yeah. in the one under Santa Teresa, and as a woman, I feel uncomfortable because when you go around the bend, you don't know what is at the other end, even though it's a shorter tunnel. Sure. And this is, as much as I like the idea of having a breezeway and not having to stop mm -hmm. and, you know, wait for traffic to cross, mm -hmm. that that tunnel is way longer than what's under Santa Teresa, correct? I, again, I, I have to apologize. I don't it's know the same, distance. It's the same, you're saying? Uh, it would be the length of the under, un, you know, the bridge itself width, uh, 76 feet full width, or if we decided to go with a narrower 64. bridge, it would be 64 okay. feet. Yeah, I think where I was coming from, and again, past councils, and we actually brought this up with the school board a year, a year or two ago, um, is, you know, I don't know what the, you know, who's walking under the Santa Teresa Bridge, um, but with this one here, with the proximity of, yeah, apparently it's just Al. <laughs> um, um, but, um, yeah. He's not one of the homeless people. <laughs> uh, um, but uh, the, the issue here was, um, was the proximity of, uh, of the elementary schools and, you know, the kids that might be walking through there. So, I mean, that, that was the issue that, that previous councils and school boards were, were getting at. So. It, it, is a it is a straight shot, so you, it's not on a curve, so you can see from one end to another, it, and it will, be, it will be well lit, and there is an alternative at grade. Uh, so, uh, yeah, actually, that made me feel a lot better that there is an alternative, you know. But okay, please continue. Sure, unless you had another. Cost. So we've gone through the alternatives. Okay, so looking at option three, uh, which again that we just talked about is this uh, roundabout here and replacing the roundabout uh, at Park or Uvis Park Drive and Tenth with a stop control T intersection. Uh, the cost savings of converting it straight from a roundabout to a stop controlled intersection is estimated about $750,000. Again, if there's no signal, if you were to put in a signal, the cost of the signal would, could be anywhere between two hundred fifty and 500000 so you've cut your savings down significantly if, if the breezeway bridge is eliminated. Uh, the T intersection would certainly be easier to construct and the, there's lower uh, construction and maintenance cost. Uh, the cons, again, would function. Uh, there's a fear that the T-intersection, the stop sign, uh, would, would not function well uh, as the roundabout um, and could have level of service impact specifically uh, during the school drop-off time where there's heavy traffic. And this was specifically brought up as a concern from the BPAC. Uh, it would be more difficult and costly to construct the roundabout in the future, and we know construction costs go up over time, so building it now would be cheaper. Uh, and the T-intersection may need to be signalized again to provide a site safer crossing in the, uh, for the levy trail based on option two. So, Gary, mm -hmm. can you go back to the, the diagram for this one here? Just quickly, uh, staff's recommendation is to replace the roundabout with the stop controlled intersection. Uh, the BPAC's recommendation was to keep the roundabout mm -hmm. and build it um, as the project. Um, so if you go, the that, that's the one right there. Mm -hmm. So assuming people decide to you know, use the, the path up above and not the breezeway here, Yes. As I look yeah. at this, and I'm imagining myself kind of driving around a roundabout, my thing is, is as a <coughs> driver, my vision is kind of on right. the curvature of the roundabout. Correct. And I'm not looking far enough to see if anybody's kind of um, crossing right there at that intersection. So I really don't set my sight there until my wheels are pretty much straight and I'm ready to kind of go on into that. Does that... Does that roundabout impact that line of sight and that safety for others, or is that just is that just me? It's it's dependent. Line of sight is critical for roundabouts, whether it's uh, vehicular, bicycle, or um, pedestrian. And so it's critical when we design the roundabout that we make sure we take all that into consideration. And the key thing there, it, when you're looking at that, is really the landscaping here in the center. It has to be low. It has to be visible. You have to be able to look either through it or over it. So as you're driving, you're right, as you're driving around it, you have to be able to see not only a pedestrian here, but a pedestrian here that could be crossing. Mm -hmm. So we have to take all that into consideration. Roundabouts are uh, pretty safe when it comes to uh, traffic control, when it comes to pedestrian and bicycle safety and vehicular safety because uh, you're having the vehicles entering at such a slow yeah, speed it slow and it forces you to slow down. It's a, it's a traffic calming uh, 
tool. As, as we saw in our traffic calming document just this last week, this is one of the class two or phase two uh, traffic calming uh, tools in our toolbox. Uh, so you do enter at a slow speed, which allows the driver not only to uh, look out for other vehicles, but other uh, items within the uh, roundabout, including pedestrians. So this certainly doesn't have all the features you would see in a roundabout, including the high visibility crosswalk, including all the striping you would typically see. So again, this is just a rendering. Uh, when it was all detailed out, you would see a lot more uh, higher end improvements in terms of uh, pedestrian safety improvements for the intersection. So, so two other questions then about this design. Yeah. What is the estimated speed that people will be moving around the curvature of the roundabout? 10 to 15 miles an hour. 10 to 15. What's the distance between the end of the roundabout and the beginning of that crosswalk there? I don't know off the top of my head, but it's, it's, it's again, something where you would, it, it would provide adequate uh, stop control sight distance uh, so you could you know see the pedestrian be able to react and then be able to stop in time to see a pedestrian in the crosswalk okay because that that's my concern just as I look at it and again how I think as I go through roundabouts and I'm still relatively new right. to try to figure out you know right. the, the nice thing about this as well is that you've got a pedestrian that's out here plainly visible that's that's not buried out behind the landscaping. So you've got a nice approach out here where the uh, pedestrian is visible. You've got a refuge island here for the pedestrian to be in if need be. And then you've got a very short crossing from that pedestrian refuge to the next crossing here. So it can actually be done in three in two separate stages. So it's these are actually very safe for pedestrians to cross. Okay, thank you. Another question, sorry for me. Um, and I know uh, Councilwoman Bankley brought it up about um, Santa Teresa, but don't we have another sort of breezeway or tunnel by on um, Camino? No, I thought there was one in Camino Real Road, uh, right? Yeah, you know what I'm talking about, right? Right. Come on up, please. Come on up, please. So. If you didn't explain to council what I'm referring to. Um, so you're referring to east of the freeway, right? I, sorry. East of the freeway, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, there is there is a, a Valley Water um, Water District Maintenance Access Road that goes under uh, the freeway. Right. Um, and I think it extends out to Camino Arroyo. Um, but the one I was thinking of was under Luchesa that we maintain as the city. Right. It's not as wide as <clears throat> this breezeway. So um, I was looking at the floor tiles to see, you know, what 64 feet or 76 uh, feet would be. So this is about 66 feet from wall to wall. So just to put perspective, right. um, that's that's the the tunnel that we're um, referring to. Yeah. And, and I bring that up because, again, I know there's uh, questions or comments about um, safety issues, but knowing that we have sort of very similar sort of walkthroughs, um, again, without knowing, having factual information that it is a safety hazard, or um, I, I am a little cautious in saying that, no, we shouldn't do it because of safety. I just want to make sure. I I completely understand. It, it's a personal thing, right? For What's not safe right. for me may not be you know, um, safe for another person. So um, in this particular case, it provides an opportunity where people that don't feel safe can actually walk up to the intersection and cross the, the street that way. Um, but at this point, we can't, you know, we can't, we're not saying this is safe, it's not unsafe. Right. Yeah, yeah, no. we're, we're looking at it from a cost it's, perspective. Right, cost perspective. But one, one last question, because I know I've, I've, I've gone through these in different cities where very similar to what's here and they have, um, at both ends and even one in the middle, they have one of those blue sort of safety boxes where you Emergency, press yeah. and it keeps, it keeps it safe. So again, I know we're only looking at cost, but I don't want us to get bogged down on it's safe or it's not safe. Okay. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Please continue. Just quickly, anecdotally, I just uh, talked to the police chief as I, as Groom was speaking here and asked him about his thoughts about the tunnel. And basically he said, you know, you're, you're exchanging one safety issue for another. If you remove the tunnel, you're crossing at grade, so you know, you're crossing with traffic, and so it's one safety, it's a, it's a trade-off. All right, so now, um, 
Have we gone through three yet? Okay, so so option three then again, you're looking at the uh, the different options here, the T intersection. Okay, so again, BPAC's recommendation was to keep the roundabout. Moving into option four. So this is the first of the two drop-off zones in front of the Gilray High School. Um, this one is pretty extensive in terms of its scope. It widens uh, 10th Street here. It adds sidewalk on both the north side and the south side of the intersection, as well as adding a landscape median in the middle of the roadway. Uh, cost savings here, if this was removed, is about 400000 uh, and removal of the, uh, this improvement does not affect the design or construction of the 10th Street Bridge. So I should indicate that um, when this was presented to the BPAC, Alvaro was here from the school district, and he came up and spoke during the public testimony uh, for, uh, on those items. Uh, and he was very supportive of the city in general on this project. Uh, and know, knew that we were struggling with this and had been working on this 10th Street Bridge project for a, a number of years and was uh, very much understanding that we had to move forward on this project. Uh, obviously, the safety improvements in front of Gilroy High School are important to the school district, but he... Okay. <laughs> Let me start over. Um, so, so, so uh, that, 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 I mean, that was going to be my question, Gary. Is, so, Alvaro does, was... Does the school... You, your office has been in contact with the school district. The school district has provided your office with feedback. How do they feel about this? So, so Alvaro actually provided it at the meeting itself. He said he was in, in favor of the, the improvements. However, if the city decided not to use general fund money to build these, he would be in favor of working with the city to find alternative funding sources to make these improvements or to build these improvements. That was his stance on it, and he was supportive of the city and working with the city okay. on these two projects. Question. So these are improvements for the school? Correct. Is there a funding participation from the school district? There is not. S okay. Sorry. Is that, is that an inappropriate question? Why, why wouldn't that be something the school district would pay for if it's a benefit, if it's for the school? The decision to include both of these next two options was made before any of us were here. So we don't know the history on it. Is I'll, I'll explain in just a second. Oh, it was never asked to the school district. It right. was just part of the design. It was, it was, part, it was of part of the design. Okay, that we, so that another we alternative adopted. could be to ask if they would like to fund it. Uh, it could be, yes. Or, yes, it could be that... Well, yeah. I'm just saying that it's, you know, it, it, oh, I'm know just... Well, nobody's got money. Nobody has money. That's true. So, yeah, okay, true. thank you. And Marie, if I may chime in a little bit, yeah, a few years ago when we had this discussion... Uh, on the school board, yeah, it was never proposed to us as us contributing funds. It's just what, which one did we think was the best option? That's all that really, um, I, I do recall um, additional conversation is, would we, the school district, be able to help fund? And obviously the answer was no to that, so, yeah. But again, what Alvaro indicated was he would be happy to work with us to try and find alternative funding sources outside of this project if that was the decision of the council. So, looking at the cons, removal of this, uh, this component of the project would remove planned safety improvements from the Gilroy High School um, project or the Gilroy High School uh, frontage um, and would go against any previously conducted uh, public outreach that's occurred that this engineering staff is unfamiliar with because we weren't around at the time that this was done. So, because of that, staff is neutral on this option because we don't know the history on this. Uh, but the B and the BPAC's recommendation was to remove the drop-off in this zone. This first phase was, uh, their recommendation was to remove this drop-off. That's on the west side, right? This is the first one between Uvis and... and the west, west side, okay. Yeah, I just want to make sure. Between yeah. Uvis and Orchard, yes. Okay, thank you. You'll find the different recommendation on the next section. This next drop-off, which is the primary drop-off in front of the school, um, the, the scope of work here is a little bit more extensive. We're going to talk about this roundabout separately uh, as, as, as separate option, option number six. So it's not included as part of this drop-off now. At which That's we, what, Orchard? This is at Orchard here, yes. We'll talk about that separately. This drop-off here, the scope here we're talking about now, uh, includes a widening in front of the school. Uh, it includes a double-loaded uh, drop-off zone here, 
extensive utility improvements and, and relocations, landscaping along the frontage, a landscape median along the, the, the center line of the road, a, a barrier or a fence along the center of the road which would uh, prohibit drop off on the north side and then illegal crossing uh, of students across uh, the street. So it would really force parents to use that drop off on the south side. Uh, so this is the scope of, of this project option five here. Removal of this option would save the project about $750,000. Uh, again, removal of the option does not affect the bridge design or construction. Um, and would eliminate extensive impacts due to landscaping, sidewalk, driveways, and underground utility relocation. Uh, similar to the previous one, removal, uh, the cons would be that it would be taking away significant safety improvements from in front of Gilroy High School uh, and would be going against a lot of uh, outreach and a lot of work that was done previously by uh, engineering staff with work with the community in Gilroy High School. Um, because of that, again, our staff is neutral at this time. Uh, however, the BPAC was in favor of keeping this drop-off zone. Moving on to option six is the discussion about the roundabout at Orchard. Uh, now, this is the design that was presented by the current engineer uh, who's doing the bridge work right now. Uh, this is actually offset, we feel, too far to the south. We feel that this roundabout should be pushed a little bit further to the north, which would actually push into the properties here on the north side of the street, requiring, we believe, property acquisition from these two property owners. So um, there's, this would be some significant right-of-way property costs here if this were designed properly. We don't think this is designed as it should be right now. So the pros here of elimination, eliminating this uh, would, would save us the money on eliminating the, uh, or, or elimination of the need for additional right-of-way. Uh, as it stands now, uh, it looks to be saving us about a million dollars if we were to take away this, uh, this roundabout. Uh, it could be more, again, if we don't need the right-of-way, uh, which is not estimated into the project cost at this time. Uh, it would eliminate the long-term maintenance cost needs. Uh, the control would then be consistent. Uh, with the adjacent signals at Prince Val and 10th because we are recommending it to be putting in a signal here instead of the roundabout. Um, however, if the signal's not warranted because we would do a warrant analysis, we would consider putting in a hawk, which is a high intensity activated crosswalk signal for pedestrians. Uh, it should be noted that uh, with the last CIP budget, uh, we did uh, fund, or this, this council did fund a rectangular rapid flash beacon and a high visibility crosswalk improvement project uh, that is currently in design and scheduled for installation later on next year in spring and summer. So that's going to be installed. Uh, we can move forward if council directs us to, to look at a signal warrant uh, and or then put in a hawk if not warranted uh, if we decide not to go with the roundabout. Uh, the cons would be that it would eliminate a potential traffic calming improvement uh, and would still require the modification to the Gilroy High School driveway, which would become the northbound approach to the intersection. Uh, staff is recommending to, uh, again, go with the signal if warranted, if not, go with the Hawk and the BPAC uh, concurred with that recommendation. So this is a summary of what we presented to you. Uh, this evening in terms of the six options, uh, which could save a, a total of upwards of $5 million if eliminated uh, entirely from the scope of the project uh, or more. Again, not talking about the right-of-way savings for the uh, orchard roundabout. Uh, and then a summary again of the staff recommendations and BPAC recommendations. Just quickly in terms of the bridge funding, uh, Glen Loma Development Agreement requires the developer to construct the bridge and for the city to reimburse upon completion of that construction. Uh, recently updated TIF project costs for the 10th Street Bridge is now estimated at 19.3 million as we just discussed. There's currently not sufficient funding in the next five years to reimburse the development current cost of the bridge because over the last several years we've been collecting TIF funds assuming the bridge cost was at 6 million. So we would have to build up TIF dollars for a number of years to at that 19.3 rate to have money in the fund to be able to reimburse at that rate. Uh, Public Works is continuing to search for alternative state and federal funding sources and know that uh, again we are going to be updating the TIF program once the general fund or general plan is complete uh, in the next year or two. 
So in terms of alternatives, council may choose to consider uh, continuing with the full design uh, of the project, the full $27 million, uh, including all six options, or may choose to modify any one or more of the options as presented this evening, and staff will then move forward with those design uh, alternatives uh, and direct the designer to complete the project design as directed. Uh, we'll also be moving forward. Uh, yeah, we can't hear you at all. Mm, all right, sorry. We'll also be moving forward with the environmental review, both with the uh, state uh, CEQA as well as the NEPA environmental review so we can be eligible for both state or federal funding uh, into the future. That concludes the presentation. Councilmember Tucker. <clears throat> okay, thank you very much. Uh, one of the questions I have is, um, is there a certain amount of homes that, ha that, uh, that are built that triggers the building of this? Did I say that right? Uh, 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 so right now you're saying that they're only at the 500th home. So is it at the 1,000th home that they have to, because of traffic circulation, that they have to have the bridge built? Or believe, is there a trigger? The trigger is once they, I believe, cross over, there's a mid-channel mid, mid -channel of the, uh, within the development, and once they cross over that, I believe there's a requirement to build a bridge. But if the city doesn't have the money to build it, does that stop the building of all the, of the ongoing um, development of the whole project for Glen Loma? At that point, yes. It would? It would. Mm -hmm. Okay. Anybody else? Otherwise, I'm going to go to public council member Rocco, and then I'll go to uh, I, I would public. like to see us tonight start making some decisions. You know, we talk about this and talk about it and talk about it. It keeps coming back. And... and I mean, whoever even started this design, I, 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 there's some issues because to think the city has $27 million laying around to build a bridge. This went from a simple bridge across the creek to this elaborate thing fixing uh, streets in front of the high school a half a mile away and stuff. Let's just get down to the basics and build a bridge and that's it, and have the breezeway underneath, and, and done. And we can go out and bond for it. But if we don't do something, it just continues to escalate the price. Every month it goes up. And, and we need to, to uh, get it done, not have it in planning for the next three, four, five years, like the last stuff we just heard. You know, it, stuff just ends up in planning, and it never goes anywhere. And, the, you know, they, we just keep getting the same presentations over and over again. They've been adjusted a little bit. Okay. Let's uh, go to the public for comment. Shauna? Uh, Tom Fisher followed by Al Panero. Good evening, Mayor, Council. Uh, first, I'd like to thank you uh, for aggressively pursuing the Glen Lomo Fire Station. Uh, I think that's a really important uh, uh, safety issue for those of us that live in the, in the uh, southwest quadrant. Uh, coupled with that is this 10th Street Bridge. And I hope that you'll be just as aggressive at trying to get this bridge built. Uh, I know there's a, a funding problem. It's, it's an expensive project. Uh, normally, uh, I would be in favor of building the bridge as it's originally designed. Uh, do the entire project because a lot of thought and a lot of effort went into coming up with that design uh, and there's a lot of good reasons behind probably every feature that's on there. However, I did attend the uh, uh, Bike and Ped Commission meeting uh, last week when they got their presentation and, and I'm inclined to support the recommendations of the Bike and Ped uh, Commission. Uh, narrowing the bridge uh, probably will not have an effect on the community for uh, many, many years. And, uh, but uh, to keep the roundabout at the at uh, Uvis Parkway is important for traffic circulation. Uh, keeping the bridge, uh, the, the underpass for the pedestrians is important for, for safety. Uh, and, and the other uh, recommendations from the bike and pet I fully support. So uh, I hope you'll be bold and be aggressive. 
I believe that you can uh, finance this bridge. You, you don't have to have $27 million in your pocket. Uh, you can finance it. You can amortize it over 20 or 30 years. Uh, I, I'm sure there's a way to do this, and, and I'd ask you to uh, please proceed. Thank you. Al Panero. Good evening, Council. It's been uh, about seven years since I've been here, so uh, excuse me for my nervousness in front of all of you. Uh, I uh, want to thank the Council. Yeah, I'll just two things. One, if you could speak up, pull, pull the thing to, uh, towards you. To my time, and, so and two, <laughs> just pretend you're talking to me on the phone and you'll, you'll start yelling at me pretty soon. So uh, let me, first of all, just uh, the reason I came down this is the first thing that ever brought me down because I don't try to you know, get into your business. You, you do a great job, and I know how hard it is, the job that you have uh, to deal with. But this is something, as Councilmember Bracco said, that uh, we need to address. We, we had a vision back then, and let me just go back and say that you all sit there, you're not, this is not your profession. We pay hundreds of thousands of dollars to people to kind of give us direction. We pay to our city administrator to be the eyes and ears of the council. We pay the professionals. They in turn go out and get professionals. So we're given all this information and then we make decisions based on the best that we know how. That's exactly what we did in 2005. And had we envisioned the fact that this was going to take this long? No, because if you look at your reports, and by the way, there's a lot of information there if you read the whole thing. If you look at your reports, it talks about how they were going to start phasing and when it was going to start phasing. And it didn't happen because of the economy, because of everything else. And we got stuck as a city because escalating costs keep going up, and we as a city don't have the mechanism and didn't have a mechanism in there to address any of that. And so we're stuck. And I'm hoping that you're going to learn from some of those mistakes back then that you will learn for the future. But there's no question that whether you have to bond, whether you have to do an internal funding, as, as Tom talked about, you've got to attack this thing and you've got to get it done. This community deserves a road that gets safety in and out of that corridor. The ones of us that I live south of First Street, I mean north of First Street, uh, and, you know, just that whole south end and having to deal with that traffic. And then these folks trying to go, you need to get it done and you need to own up to it. We made the decisions. You carry some of the burden now, but you got to find a solution to it. Some of these things, you know, I don't agree with Tom. That's not unusual, but I don't agree with Tom when it talks about saving a million dollars on not keeping that bridge wide. If you don't do it now, it's never going to happen, and this city is not going to shrink. It's going to keep growing. That corridor is going to grow. And in the future, you'll never be able to catch up to save a million dollars today is nothing. And if you don't get it done, it's, it's going to cost you a lot more in the future. Some of the recommendations I certainly don't, don't agree with because you're trying to save pennies. When somebody talked about getting rid of that breezeway underneath that bridge, I, you know, as you can tell, I'm now skidding off. <laughs> I, I walk that, you know, Santa Teresa under, underneath that, and you're correct. It kind of bends over. This one's a straight shot. So it should be... You know, no problem. Don't start making issues when they're not there in other situations within our city. So all I'm here to say is that I, I feel for you. I know it's not an easy thing to do, but we made decisions back there. We got the direction, and we got folks that are the professionals that gave us all this. Do we need all the fluff that some of you talked about? Maybe some of it can be helped. But that bridge has to happen, should be wide enough to where you don't have to later in the future, mess with it, get it done now, get it done the right way. And I thank you very much and appreciate all the hard work you do because I know you get paid a lot of money and people really appreciate what you're doing. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Connie Rogers. Thank you. Good evening. I can be very brief. I just want to support exactly what Tom Fisher and Mayor Pinheiro said. Um, we've talked about this for years and years and years, and it's time to do it now because it will take a couple years to get it built, 
and we don't have enough cross town streets. We desperately need this one. So whatever you have to do to get it done, do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? Okay, uh, back to council for uh, discussion. Just if I may provide one clarification, um, specifically the development agreement in terms of the timing of the construction of the bridge, uh, in terms of the improvements, the list of improvements, the timing is to construct, construction will start within 90 days of when the city has obtained all permits and approvals subject to permit restrictions, completion estimated to be no later than the date that Merlot Drive connection is made across Reservoir Canyon Creek. So when they propose to build uh, Merlot Drive over the canyon, as I indicated, that's when they're required then to build that bridge. Build that bridge, and it's all predicated upon us getting any kind of uh, permitting for permit. that, working with them. And, on and that. so, fish and wildlife, they they would be a permitting agency, right? Correct. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Mayor Wayman, I Gary. Gary. I thought in the staff report. Merlot Drive was a determining factor in the beginning, but something changed, and they said Merlot Drive was no longer a factor. It was something else. Uh, does anyone have right? They changed the right? Oh, it's just a name change. Name change. Huh? Whenever they cross Canyon Creek, though, is the is the key factor. Though. Is it the same area, or is it just a name change? That's what I thought too. We'll double check. Okay. Okay. We'll double check and let the council know. Okay. But but uh, just want to make sure I still understand this. There is still a trigger though. There's a trigger within the development yeah. agreement. Okay. So okay. Whenever that whenever that road whatever it happens to be crosses, that's when it's triggered. We'll double check on that. Councilmember Leroy Munoz. So I'll, I'll start the uh, the discussion and I'll share my thoughts on the two options that I think are, are most important to me at least, um, where I feel the most strongly about it, I should say. Uh, the first is option one with regard to the shrinking down of the width of the bridge. Um, I, I very much support the ideas um, that Mr. Pinedo spoke about earlier in that you're, if you're going to do this, you're really only going to get one bite at the apple. And for me, I don't like closing off optionality if I can avoid doing so. And, and I, I also agree in the sense that the, the population of the city is only going to continue to grow. And so I, I would hate to have us have the opportunity to build a sufficiently large bridge, bridge to allow for the capacity, but instead artificially shrink that down and then it becomes a choke point at a later point. Mm -hmm. So for me, preserving the larger width is, is important. The second is with regard to option two. And, you know, I, I'm kind of torn between the, the safety issues. Again, as, as the police chief had mentioned, you're kind of trading one safety issue for another. But I am I, most worried about the safety of a multitude of kids trying to cross that street without a breezeway mm -hmm. that keeps them out of traffic. Um, and I, I recognize the challenges and the potential issues that come with a breezeway, but given the fact that it's kind of a straight shot and that if we can pursue uh, some sort of lighting or something to maximize visibility in there, I think that presents less of a danger than having a variety of kids trying to cross cross the street there. Mayor, do you mind if I add something to what Council Member Lerone Munoz just said? Mm -hmm. Actually, when you look at the length of the breezeways, you know, again, we're having this discussion, sort of I just Googled, um, the Santa Teresa is 70 feet in length. Uh, the Camino... Real Street, I believe, is 60 feet in length. So in reality, they're very similar in length. Um, so again, and still, it's a, it's a narrow shot compared to the other ones. So I mention that because, again, I know that we've had this, we're having this discussion about safety, but just keep in mind they're all very similar in length, and, um, but this is a bit different. Just Thanks. if I may, Mr. Mayor, th this room is about 60 foot in width, just for reference. And, and just to kind of build on one other thing I, would, I just thought of this. We're also still preserving that optionality. If people do feel unsafe or they want to use another means by which they can cross the street, we still preserve that way to do it. Yeah. So it keeps no, our I options agree. open. I agree. Councilmember Brocco. Gary, we'll come back up. On the reduced size option, yeah. you took most of it out of the center median, correct? 
All of it, and, yes. And so there's still room for four lanes on that bridge? No. No. You, you no. said? No, we're reducing the median from 16 foot to four feet. So what we'll be left with is a two lanes of traffic, a buffered class two bike lane, and an eight foot wide sidewalk on but either side. But didn't you say if the need arose that it could be reconfigured if to, we were to keep to the have 16, four lanes. If we were to keep the 16 foot wide median, which would be keeping the full 76 foot wide bridge oh, okay. and not reducing it. Once we reduce the median, that shrinks the width of the bridge and we lose the ability to use that median in the future for restriping purposes to get four lanes of traffic. So how would that work, having four lanes of traffic dumping onto 10th Street, which is already like maxed out? Well, we'd have to at some point figure out a way to stripe 10th Street and have to be four lanes. Which, which would be difficult, which was what I had in my presentation. We don't see the, the, we don't see the need at this point to have uh, 10th Street That's be why four the, lanes you said that. at this point, or to have uh, the Glen Loma side be four lanes. There's just never gonna be the need for capacity uh, for four lanes of traffic. Uh, it, two lanes of traffic will be all that's ever needed for that 10th Street corridor between 101 and uh, uh, Santa Teresa. Thank you. Yeah, but I mean, just intuitively, for us to say there's never going to be the need mm -hmm. worries me. And and too often, you know, councils make decisions, and then years later, when those decisions come to to be realized, mm -hmm. you say, "Boy, if I only knew now what I didn't know then," and so. Intuitively, I like having that option of building, of, of a full Absolutely. build out. Absolutely. You know, having those two lanes in each direction. But just understand the current general plan, even the one we're working on right now and looking at the model, even with the alternatives that have just been recently discussed, putting those into the model does not require the need for a four lane bridge. No, I now, understand. Future I understand general plan saying. certainly might, but if we were to go with a four lane bridge, there's significant work on either side, the east side and the west side, to widen 10th Street, both in front of the high school and, and to getting to 101 and within Glen Loma to make those sections four lane because there's no reason to have a four lane bridge unless you have four lanes on either side as well to get both to Santa Teresa and to get to 101 or certainly to get to, to Prince Val or, or to, to Chestnut where it turns into four lanes. Okay. Thank you. Councilmember Dion, were you done? Yes. Councilmember Bracco? Tucker, I'm sorry. Councilmember Tucker. I just wanted to, um, what you're talking about is, is when you're saying two lanes, it will be built with two lanes and a 16 foot medium. One, la one lane one in lane. each direction. Right. That's a so, two lane configuration. But with the 16 foot, no, let me finish talking. It was with the 16-foot medium so that in the future it could go to four lanes. Two but right direction. now when you're building it, you're not building four lanes. Correct. It so it's be. not going to trigger the four lanes on either side until sometime in the future, theoretically at the 2040 build out of another 20,000 people or something in the future, not right now. That's correct? The design that's currently in the, the 65% plans, the 76 foot wide bridge currently has one lane in each direction and a 16 foot wide median. Okay, so, so, so the discussion about whether or not is to have that ability to go to four in the future right. because it would be harder to widen it. Right. So it doesn't make sense to not do that because it, right. it, it, you, you know, how are you gonna add <laughs> you know, whatever it is, eight feet on either side, even 25 years from now, it will be difficult, a lot more trouble and a lot more money. We've if we're going to go, my, my suggestion is if we're going to go to a bond anyways, we might as well do the max or what the original design is. And honestly, I was here. I just don't remember from a technical point of view why we said we needed four lanes. I, I don't know technical. I don't think we plan to have 100,000 people you know, in the future, but I don't know. I don't remember, to be honest. And, and I, I want to go back to what um, what Al Pinero said. The fact is that design was done by a professional. I, I, I'm a, I was against and still have a very uh, concern about that breezeway, but 
it's one safety hazard over another safety hazard. So I would rather keep the breezeway well lit and patrolled. I remember that was one of my concerns was patrolled by the police. But um, then have students walking across uh, that. Because right now when I use these roundabouts on Santa Teresa, some of those cars go faster than 10 miles an hour. And I don't know that you can see if somebody's walking across that you would, even if you could see them, that you would be able to stop in time to, to stop hitting them. Because even if you are, the guy behind you might not be paying attention and then you have a bang. At, at any rate, so I don't like the breezeway, but I think it's safer than walking across the top. Uh, I do think that if we're going to bond anyways, we might as well bond for, for the intent. And whatever the intent was at the time of the design, there's got to be a technical reason why the professionals back then decided that. However, sa having said that, that's for the bridge. I disagree with, with all the stuff in front of the school. <laughs> and I disagree with two roundabouts within a block of each other. I think it's crazy. So however the design is, if you need the roundabout at Uvis, because that's safer than not the roundabout at Orchard. So I, I personally don't agree with all the, the um, Gilroy High improvements. Okay. Council Member Marks. Gary, I found it. It's in the second staff report, page 27. It says the plan was revised since 2005 so that it is now the West Luchessa extension Just that will cross Reservoir Canyon instead of Merlot Drive. We did okay. find that, yes. Okay, and I have a question for you because I'm having a hard time visualizing this. So the bridge would be four lanes if needed. Um, but where would the four lanes start west of the bridge? You know, would, would you go from two lanes into this four-lane bridge, then when you come off the bridge, you go down to two lanes again to go into the roundabout? Would that cause a backup on the bridge? On the west side? Okay, L let me back up. I'm asking two, I'm basically saying two different things. Okay. Um, when you end, okay, let's go to west of the bridge. On the Glen Loma side. On the Glen Loma side. Okay. The bridge, let's pretend it's four lanes, okay? Where... Uh, you would be on, where would it start the four lanes west on the Glen Loma side? It's currently two lanes. Right. On the Glen Loma okay, side. Okay, so that's my issue. So right. you're going two lanes, you get to the bridge, it now becomes four lanes, and then when you cross over the bridge, you're heading into the Uvis uh, Levy roundabout, you're going to go back to two lanes again, correct? Is that going to cause a backup? I just see in my mind that's so much easier just to keep it two lanes back and forth because I just picture people, I guess I would be guilty of this too, uh, of speeding up to, to speed up to pass on that bridge to get ahead of some traffic and then zip across. I mean, does that make sense, my question? Or? Find me, that's, <clears throat> that's what we're trying to communicate. Even, even if you build a four-lane um, bridge, mm -hmm. The receiving ends on either side are going to be two lanes. Two lanes, yes. Unless we make investment and put the money in today mm -hmm. to make uh, the widening or the acquisition that's needed on either side of the bridge right. to make that a four-lane compatible all the way through. So I think we need to think about that issue also. All right. Thank you. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Gary, I have a couple of questions, but first of all, um, for me, I would be in favor of keeping the breezeway, obviously. Um, you know, you're looking at the roundabouts, I believe, that, um, and you correct me if I'm wrong, I think the Uvis Park one would probably be the, the most ideal of the two. Um, and then, um, obviously, keeping the, the width of the bridge as well for all the um, reasons that were talked about. But in regards to the uh, Gilroy High School drop-off, you have the drop-off zone on the east and then one on the west. And correct me, and maybe um, Mr. Panero or whoever else was on the city council back then, um, when this decision was made, A, first of all, it would affect safety measures for s students, wouldn't it, if we decided not to go with these drop off zones? Again, I wasn't, I'm not familiar with the current drop off. I believe the drop off right now is on site. Right. Uh, and so that would be the drop off along the frontage there. I believe there are currently drop off both on street in front of the school right now and, and on site. Okay. And then the other, I'm just reading what it says here. The other two is when this was presented back, back when to the community, it was with the discussion or with the, um, 
with the belief that um, we were going to have these drop-off zones included in this. So yeah. we would go against what the community sort of. That's what we presented in the staff right. report that we had there, there had. And my predecessors had gone through and done a lot of outreach with the community. Right, and, that and that's how it was sold to the community with these. So I just want us to keep that in mind, but also, again, I guess. That was a discussion with yeah, the community. Yeah, that was a discussion, but I guess the unanswered question, obviously, is the importance of either of these drop-off zones at the high school. You know, what's the effect if we were to, A, do none of them, or B, do one, one of the two, or do both? I don't know. I mean, I guess that's all a question. I, all I could respond is, again, what uh, Alvaro indicated during his uh, testimony at the BPAC meeting was that obviously they would be very happy to have them. Right. Uh, they didn't have any funding and they would be supportive of working with the city to find alternative funding sources if we couldn't fund them. And, and if I may add, there's there's two things here. There's safety and right. capacity, right. right? So to the extent uh, there's a capacity issue, uh, we could encourage more safe routes to school, walking, right. biking, other modes of transportation. Uh, as far as the safety issue and people crossing from one side to the other, that yeah. becomes more of an enforcement issue. Right. So, and, I, and I appreciate that. And again, I, and I, I respect sort of the comments that were made about not wanting to sort of dive into these two um, drop-off zones. But for the point that you just made, I think it's more than sort of the funding issue, it's more of the safe, for me, it's more of the safety issue for the students if we were not to go and, and support one of these drop-off zones. I'm more in favor of making sure that the students are going to be safe. And, and from that aspect, that's why we are moving forward with that rectangular rapid flash beacon at the intersection to make sure there are safe crossings at that orchard intersection across uh, 10th. Thank you. All right. Anybody else? Okay. So... We could come up with all our options here, and I have some some uncertainty regarding one option, and you know, I I agree with some of the others, and I agree with some of the comments that have been made. But the bottom line is, how do we pay for it? So uh, I'm going to turn to a city administrator and say, you know, are you going to shake the money tree or? <laughs> You gonna um, is the council gonna be able to come back and take a look at uh, bonding options? Um, if nothing else, just look into seeing how much it would cost to, to bond. I could think of three things off the top of my head right now that that w that are worth bonding for, and um, and I think if we package everything together and come up with a concrete idea of, okay, if we want to do various capital projects. I, I think I just came up with another one, uh, three or four different things. If we want to come up with some capital project list that we want to bond for, including this bridge, you know, how much is it going to cost right now out in the market? And so, Gabe, my question for you is, we we could come up with these options here, but but then what? So really, the, one of the options, the one I see that one of the only options for 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 a council would be bonding these these improvements. Mm -hmm. um, attempting to do interfund loans, you have water and sewer that have a little bit of cash, but we're getting ready to undertake capital projects consistent with the master plans as adopted as part of the rate studies that we're behind schedule on. Uh, you're sitting on 30 30 percent of your general fund reserves, uh, but otherwise. There's the TIF doesn't have sufficient monies at this point to cover the bridge. Um, so your one alternative would be to, for us. Well, the good thing is we just got our, uh, our bond rating uh, from right. from the creditors improving an improved bond rating. So maybe that will help us. So what we can do is consult with our financial advisor in terms of what they believe is the city's bonding capacity based on our budget. Uh, that would require, though, that if you do a general obligation bond, prior to the bond issuance, we, as the city, would have to demonstrate what that repayment capability is for the city. So we would have to demonstrate in the budget that we have sufficient revenue to pay for the to pay the debt service. 
when you issue bonds, you can't pledge future money. In other words, we can't say that this is how much money we're going to get from the TIF and this is how much money we're going to get from public facility impact fees. Uh, they don't count that as revenue. You have to be able to demonstrate the city's capability to pay that that debt. It's just like any, just in the private sector, you go borrow money, you got to show that you can repay back the money. So we would need to look at and consult with the finance advisor and then come back to you and have those conversations. But we know that when we were looking at about a $30 million bond, we were, that was about two and a half to 3 million per year on, on debt service. So um, that might be less now because of our improved bond rating, but you figure it's going to be around that on anywhere between 25 million and 30 million. You're looking at about 2 million per uh, for that amount. So if you want to do 50 or 75, you're easily looking between four to six million in annual debt service for, uh, if you were to take cumulatively all of the different projects that we have on the books as capital projects. So um, that's something to think about. But a lot of it's gonna depend on what our bonding capacity is um, in terms of what's that dollar amount. At the end of the day, we may want 80 million, but our bonding capacity based on our budget and what we can get on the market may only be half of that. We don't know, but we would need to consult with our financial advisor on that. So, but, so that's my point though, is that the next step is for, for the council to direct staff to, um, to, get, to get some of that information and bring it back to council because we could start to prioritize, we could start to figure out what, what it is that we want to bond and, uh, and for how much, is that right? Whatever our comfort level is, based upon your well, so, so it's our comfort level and our bonding capacity, right, right, based on our financial situation. So, we do have a study session scheduled for February 13th, which between now and then would allow us to do some preliminary um, analysis and work with our financial advisor, and it would allow them some time to also do an analysis of what that capacity is, and hopefully we have some information to come back to you at the February 13th um, scheduled study session, in which we'll be talking about other fiscal policies. So that's one alternative. Okay. All right, Council Member Bracco. Okay, um, is there any chance of getting any money from VTA in the water district? Um, Ooh, that's a good question. That, that, yeah, that's a good question. I know the, val the val Valley Water, we might have some grant programs, but and then VTA, I know in the past when we were looking at doing the improvements for First Street, they were willing to consider making a loan to the city for that construction. But, I mean, it's always uh, something that we can inquire with them. But, can we do that? Can we get that information? Yeah, it's something we can definitely, um, as part of our analysis to come back to you with um, bonding capabilities, we would look at other uh, funding sources as well. Um, and that's something that, staff is also exploring is both at the state and federal level um, what funding sources may be available for a project like this. We have not identified any specific uh, department at the federal level or state that would have these type of grants, but this would allow us to do some more due diligence to try to identify um, if there are any. Council Member Blankley. I'd like to add to what Council Member Bracco is saying and uh, come back to us with um, uh, some kind of response, Wor working with the, the school district representative and find out what alternative funding sources they are suggesting come up with because uh, at least to the extent of the cost of options four, five, and six really ought to come, I mean, those ought to be school district priorities, not the city's priorities because they are 100% related to school. So I would like to see that addressed. Okay, and um, okay, was that it? Yeah. Okay, so Gabe, with regards to these options, do you need uh, the council to give you direction on each option or how, what's the point? Yes, each option? If, if I could get item by item and get a, a consensus on each. Okay, let's, let's go through those then real quick. Uh, option one. Um, let me get to it. Option one is to reduce the bridge width. Um, 
Council, I'm torn on this one because originally um, I think we, we know Gilroy is going to continue to grow and that there may be the need to add two additional lanes, not 10 years from now, not 20 years from now, but maybe 30, 40, 50 years from now. Um, however, having said that, this pushes the problem out onto a future council to come up with um, the, the additional land that is necessary on the Glen Loma side and additional, I'm not sure what, on the, on the other side of the bridge so that we have four lanes that will flow into four lanes. Um, it does no good to create a four-lane bridge that just bottlenecks into a two-lane street again. So I'm kind of, I'm, I'm concerned about this one. Um, but I'm willing to, to hear what the rest of the council has to say. Do we pare it down or do we keep it? I, I, I think you guys we wanted... should pare it down um, because you're, you're routing the traffic back into town and it, it just can't handle it. So like our expert says, it's not ever going to happen. The, even the general plan says it doesn't need it. You know, so, and if you, le you know, this ha is another thing that happens all the time. You build it to accommodate the future, and then when you need it, all the rules have changed, and you've got to redo the whole thing again. Okay. Mayor, so can we, we have a vote to can we do a scale it down then? Mm -hmm. Okay. Scale it down. What are your thoughts? I'm, so, I'm, I'm just going to add because I, I, I'm in the same position as you because being on the general plan update committee, we talked about all this growth. First of all, we just came up, we just, uh, us, we just agreed to the GPAC's recommendation, right? I don't know if you saw all the social media comments, the negative comments, because the, 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 the GPAC recommendation was, was this mix of what the community outreach did, but it meant, um, you know, adding whatever, 20,000 more, uh, population in in the next 20 years or more anyways a lot of negative comments so if you're saying to me that even with that uh, extra 20,000 people that it's still not warranted for a four four lane bridge then then I agree with paring it down but if you said that it needed it with an extra you know if we have 75,000 people here in Gilroy in the future then, then I would say build it now. So it's it's kind of one of those build it now while it's cheaper, or do you really think we're gonna, we're not going to ever need it even with a growth of up to seventy five thousand people? And again, this is not me. This is Hexagon. Right, who is Hexagon. Running our model, yeah, uh, that has told us that. See, and the, the, just to to muddy this up even more, we're really only talking about a million dollar savings. Right. And in the grand scheme of things, right. I mean. <laughs> right. I guess so, so. That's what I'm struggling with. Yeah. Go ahead. So, go ahead. Okay. So yeah. it is, it is only a, a million only a million yeah. dollars when you're talking twenty seven million. My problem being new with this is how this got to twenty seven million in the first place is something I still don't understand. With all these reports and things that I've read, it's mm -hmm. just crazy to me that that's what it is. And in the short time that I've been on this council that number has been so vastly different. And I've only been on this council for less than two years. And it's been one number here and then 10 million more another time you ask. And almost like the fire station. So it's very difficult for me to know what to believe. So one million may be a small part of 27, but I don't know how accurate that 27 is and therefore I don't know how accurate any of these numbers are, really. So uh, that, that's really all I'm gonna say is I, I'd, I do not feel very confident in any of these numbers hmm. as, as being what, what it's actually going to be. Well, I mean, I would, I would agree with you that, you know, construction costs have accelerated faster than our, um, our escalator costs and all this stuff. No, and but, so the like, construct but every time we ask the question in just the less than two years I've been on the council, we've been given a very different number. Okay. Very different. Yeah. And, and, but to your point, though, the construction costs next year okay. could be vastly different again. And next year we'll have another number. You, know. you can't go from 15 million to 27 million in less than two years. Okay. Thank you. So, Mr. Mayor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to actually go the other way. I, I think. Well, for, uh, hang on. Let me come back to Councilmember Blanco. So, are you saying pare down or? Because I'm trying to get consensus here. 
in the end, I'm, I'm going to end up paring down because okay. the number's too big. Right, I'm just saying you. it's not as small a percentage in my mind. Good as, enough. Yeah. All right, thank you. Yes. And I'm going to go the opposite way on this one. I mean, I think, again, it preserves the optionality around one of the problems that we've pervasively seen around town, and that's our, that's our infrastructure or traffic that we have within the city. And so this preserves that opportunity that if in the future the estimates are incorrect, and, right. and Lord knows our current infrastructure, we didn't get those estimates right. Um, so I, I think this just gives us that opportunity, and if, if we get it wrong, the cost of fixing it is going to be astronomical. Yeah. So. Okay. Uh, just real quick, uh, is an EIR going to be required? Are we going to do EIR? We're doing EIR for this, right? EIR. Or is it going to be covered under the general plan? Be an EIR. A separate EIR regarding this. Okay. So yeah. if thinking about the EIR, if we go big mm -hmm. and we account for future lanes, if for some reason a future council would then be able to scale it down um, because either one that's not needed or we could always, in other words, you could, all, with, with regards to the EIR, you could always go do so, a project that's smaller, not necessarily bigger. Yeah, that's generally true. You can, you can analyze a larger project that you think you might not actually ever build, but you have it, the analysis ready. Yeah. So I think that might be a reason in itself just to go big. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay, Council Mayor. Member. Thank you, Mayor. No, for, for the reasons that were just stated from, um, I, I would be in favor of um, not reducing the bridge width. I would rather go up because of obviously the reasons that were just talked about. So I would be in favor of obviously um, making it larger than shorter. I'm say, say that last. Part. I would I would I'd be in favor of not reducing the width. Maybe. Okay. Councilman. I might say that just to, to add with the EIR, the EIR will have to look at alternatives, and for example, an alternative it conceivably could be a narrower bridge for a minute for less impact on the creek too. That's possible. Mm -hmm. Okay. Councilmember Blank. Uh, Blankly. Marks. Uh, <laughs> I think we should not reduce the bridge width because we don't know what the future holds. And I just think it's going to be really expensive if you have to go back and tear it down and add lanes. And um, I am concerned about, you know, some of the mitigation with eminent domain and, and having to buy land. Mm -hmm. But my personal opinion is just keep it to the four lanes. All right, so right now um, it looks like we have at least one, two, three, four, I'm going to go ahead and, and keep uh, uh, change five. what I originally said, which is to okay. <laughs> keep the, the, the way it is now. Okay, so uh, we have five thumbs up to keep the uh, original uh, width design. Okay, with regards to option two, um, I raised the concern regarding security issues. Uh, I, I felt a lot better knowing that there was an alternative and that it is a straight line of sight. Um, you know, we're, as was put earlier, we're trading one problem for another, so I would be in favor of, uh, of keeping the Breezeway Bridge. Same so, here. Yes. Yep. Yes. yes. All right, moving on. Gary, did, did you get that? Yes. Option three, replace the Uvis Park uh, Drive roundabout with the stop-controlled intersection. Uh, I think if this was the one that there was a difference of recommendation between the BPAC and, and staff, is that correct? That's correct. That's correct. The staff's recommendation was to replace it with a stop-controlled intersection. The BPAC recommended keeping the roundabout. Okay. And... Um, Boy, Council, I, I have no thoughts on this. Um, my my, well, my, my uh, uh, impression is that this roundabout is needed more so than the orchard. Right. Am I correct uh, from your point of view? We're recommending re replacing it with a stop-controlled intersection. Okay, so, that, <laughs> so I'm wrong. From your point of view, I mean. Okay, so... Um, uh, yeah, I... Why is that your recommendation? I thought I understood that that was your recommendation if the breezeway was not going to happen. But why is it your recommendation with the breezeway? It's a savings of a half million dollars. 
It's only a savings of five. It's only a savings of a half million dollars. It, that's another way of looking at it. It it. Uh, Since when are your guys' recommendations all about the money? <laughs> Trying to get you the became on the yeah. <laughs> I mean, that could be one reason, but is there another reason? It's only about the money? We're trying to get the project built, and we're trying to, to bring it in as, as inexpensive as possible. So we're, this, this exercise was to try and look at cost savings as much as possible. So if we were to build the roundabout, certainly if you were to ask me my professional opinion, which one, if I were to have to pick one, I would say... This, this is the one I would build. Okay, but from a traffic circulation standpoint, at, at putting your traffic, okay, this is the one. On. I, this is the one I would build. It would yes, operate sir. better than a stop-controlled yes, intersection. Yes. Uh, uh, okay, wait. If with your traffic circulation hat on, yes. you would do a roundabout or the stop. I would do a roundabout. Right. You would do a roundabout. Yes. Okay. Thank you. All right. So, so Mayor, for option three, I would I would be. Um, Against replacing the Uvis Park roundabout and keeping it, yeah. right? Option three. Uh, oh, so so option three is to keep the Uvis roundabout. Park. Yes. Okay. Council. Yes. All right. Option three. We're going to keep it. Option four: removal of the Gilder High School uh, student drop-off zone from Uvis Park Drive to Orchard Drive. Um, Staff is neutral on this option. Uh, BPAC is recommending removing the drop-off zone. Mr. Matt. Yes. I, I think we ought to just like put all this stuff over towards the high school on hold and, and have staff talk with the high school because they said if we weren't going to pay for it, they'd be willing to help pay for it and see if they can identify some money and stuff too. I mean, because they have how many bonds they have they floated. So... I, I would like to look at it like that before we just say outright no or yes. Yeah, uh, I I don't know if we could um, if we could not make any decisions on this because I, I thought the whole point of this one was a cost saving exercise, but two, you, we need to move forward with the design. The, and when we talk about the 10th Street Bridge, right. obviously we're talking about a lot more than just the bridge We would itself. like to direct our designer to move forward and complete the design one way or another and to move forward on this. And, and Council Member Bracco, the, the, the district did not indicate that they did have funding. They were willing to work with us to help us look for alternative funding sources. <laughs> Pretty much. Or for, or for grant opportunities or to co-sponsor grant opportunities. All right, so with regards to option four. Um, and that's on the I'm, west side. Drop it. I, I think we could drop it. Um, however, I do want to raise, all right, so with the option four, is it drop okay with everybody? Yeah, yes. yes to dropping? Yes. Okay, yeah. Oh, yeah, okay, right. yeah. Yes. All right, option five. I, okay. I mean, All right. So, so let me just say this with regards to the school district. Um, and I do not want to be carrying the school district water on, 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 on these issues. However, I don't know if it's entirely fair for the council to say this is a school district problem. Right. When it comes to the flow of traffic, that is a city problem. Mm -hmm. And we happen to have a high school there. And there is a lot of traffic, mm -hmm. there's a lot of kids, a lot of drop-off, a lot of pickups. And so to a certain extent, I think the city has to pick up the, right. the, the cost on that. Um, as much as I would like to be able to have the school district pay for all these things, I just don't see that happening. Right. Um, so I'm okay with the dropping it off on four. I'm not sure and I'm open to... Uh, debate on option five. So I'd like to hear what everybody has and to Mayor, say. And Mayor, if I may, yeah. if I may add. Uh, I'm not there to speak. Oops. Oops, hang on. Oh. Councilman Bracco. Um, I, I think we're running the risk of killing the project by keeping everything pretty much in the project and it's going to stay around $27 million, and I don't see the project ever happening at that price. You know, I mean, if we're not willing to compromise and drop some things off, then I, I just don't see it ever coming, you know, going to happen. 
$250,000. Okay. Council Member Tovar. Thank you, Mayor. And for option five, I would be in favor of uh, not removing um, that drop zone because um, I, I remember the discussions we had um, a while back. The school, the school district, that of the two, the east side was the one that they would be most in favor of keeping. So I would be in favor of keeping that drop zone on the east side. All right. Thank you. Council Member Marks. I understand where Council Member Bronco is coming from. However, many times when we start cutting corners, we start with a really good project that turns out to be garbage. And then we regret it later on. I don't mind number four being dropped at all because that's by the baseball field. And I don't see that many people dropping off their kids. But option five is a safety issue that I agree with the mayor. We, we perpetuated it when we allowed Glen Loma to build all those homes. So it's not the high, it's not the school district's fault, and they shouldn't have to, you know, correct it. It's us. If we make these decisions, we have to um, own up to it and provide safety measures for everyone. Um, I think it's money well spent to do that drop off there. Um, I'm not sure about the, the fence in the middle. I like the landscaping idea, but the fin but but that's you know either here nor there. Anyway, that's my two cents. I am for this. Thank you, Councilmember Tucker. I guess I thought I saw blankly. <laughs> I guess it was blankly, but she changed Tucker. her mind. <laughs> so I understand that that's the primary drop off, and we should be concerned about that. But I guess my, my I don't like this design at all. So. You know, I don't think we need a fence, a wall down the middle of 10th Street. There's a lot of things I don't like about it. So whether or not we do it is because it's $750,000, it's a big savings. So because of that and we're saving money, I mean, if you had a new, a better design, yeah, I just don't like that whole wall down 10th Street, um, whether it's a nice wrought iron beautiful wall or a cement wall, either way. I just, I, I don't like it. And I, I, if there was another way to help the, uh, the high school drop off, Without spending seven hundred fifty thousand, I'd be open to it. But, but, if, if I may respond, um, now that we have the roundabout at Uvis, uh, eastbound or westbound traffic can go down Tenth, use the roundabout, come back into the drop off, and use the drop off. If we don't have a center fence, what'll happen is you'll have parents dropping off on the north side and then short, uh, short cutting into the neighborhood, which will cause cut through traffic and we'll be dealing with traffic calming issues and having to deal with those types of requests. And then you'll have those students cutting across the street during heavy traffic times and making unsafe crossings because we don't have a center fence along through there. So myself, if we are gonna have that drop off and, and stick with that drop off on that south side, I think having a fence or some kind of barrier that prohibits the use of the uh, drop off on the north side and then having students running across the street is a critical part of that design. I mean, I understand, uh, but uh, honestly, how long has Gary High been there and how long has the street been the way it is? I mean, people do that now. I don't think it's safe now, but on the other hand, you know, it's a situation that's been livable so far. I, I don't know. <laughs> and, and if you if you would like, we could go back to design. But again, you're asking a bridge designer to design a drop off in front of a high school area. Councilmember Marks. I agree uh, with Councilmember Tucker. That's how it is right now today. The people do not circle around and drop off on the south side. They drop off on the north. Kids cross the street. They're running across. Anyway, so it would absolutely be no different. May, would it be cheaper if they redesigned the center median? There is no physical center median right now. on. Tenth. No, but you put one into option five. If And part of that median is the cost of that 750000 Could you redesign it without, without the wall and... You, you know, could, you could to you reduce could, the, the cost. You could certainly go through an exercise and redesign that. Mm -hmm. But again, I would question if you have the right design expert being a bridge designer, doing a drop off in front, uh, design in, for a high school and working with the community. See, on but that. he doesn't he doesn't live in Gilroy. He doesn't understand that people are doing it right now. Right. And but, but again, yeah. that's and again, not having the history. But mm -hmm. if you, 
part of the design with the drop off mm -hmm. is you're you're designing the drop off to be used on that south side and you're saying that's what's happening now and that's why part of the exercise that we did with mm -hmm. the somebody did with the community effort the outcome was to have that fencing along the center line there to prohibit that because they saw that potentially yeah. as an issue okay councilmember blankley I, I was, <clears throat> sorry. excuse me, uh, Council Member Marks, I was just going to add. So the problem we're trying to solve is people crossing from the north side to the south side. So the design alternatives could be a raised barrier of some sort that's high enough so kids don't jump over it, right? Or at least it, it deters that movement. Uh, we could look at sort of like a construction um, concrete barrier, which would be unsightly and it would make it look like a work zone, right? The other thing would be a decorative fence. So now we would be looking at a higher cost to the project to achieve the same result. So there may be a happy medium s somewhere in there. I think what we would like to get from council is whether or not this approach is acceptable, preventing uh, uh, people um, crossing from the north side to the south side between these limits. Uh, is, that, is that council's preference? And if so, we could look at you know uh, decorative design and something aesthetic that would be a secondary issue thank you i propose building a wall and getting the school district to pay for it <laughs> <laughs> council member blankley yeah i've been going back and forth between wanting to speak or not speak because i'm trying to understand how how this is a circulation element i don't see it as a circulation issue i mean i i don't and and that's what I need. To, that's what I would need to find or justify in order for this to be something that the city has an obligation to fund. To me, this is a drop-off improvement, a big improvement, but it's not. It's not circulation-driven. So I can. I certainly can see the benefits of it. Um, but when we're all financially strapped, I just don't understand why we, as a city council, should be saddling you know, taking that on. The school board is its own board, and that's for them to decide what is worth however much money. Um, I just, I don't see it as circulation. I, I, I don't, because circulation is there now, and drop-off zones are there now. What, what is being proposed here is improvements to those drop-offs. One other bit of fact that we found during our research, and I hadn't brought up so far this evening, is through the research and the various staff reports we looked at, um, it looks like um, back in 2008 when this project may have been initially envisioned, the, the Gilroy High School population was 2,362 students. Uh, in 2018, the count was down to 1,654. Yeah, it's another thing because Christopher, right, because Christopher opened. So I just, I, I, I do not see this as a, I'm sorry, I know the mayor had said that he sees this as a circulation thing, but I don't. I don't have to be sorry about that. <laughs> um, Thank you for that extra information because that, that's something I, I knew that, but I'd forgotten. And, and you're right. Enrollment is down, so maybe it's not really required to Yeah, what, what I was getting at is not so much uh, circulation, but, I mean, I do think we have, well, it is a circulation in the sense, in my opinion, circulation in the sense when you have parents dropping off and then they're cutting into, uh, I think it's Valley Forge there or into that... Um, uh, condo complex trying to turn around um, you know there, there's safety issues I'm sorry yeah no I know but what well, I'm hoping that we would be able to to have a, a better flow uh, of, of students going through there so um, so as I said before this I was concerned about this but I was open to hearing from the council to decide how we want to proceed so what do we want to do? You want to keep it, council member? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, thank you. Would you like to run the meeting? <laughs> um, no, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna go ahead and say I, I think it still is important. However, uh, hearing from the council, we have a majority that says uh, no to it. So we're going to drop it. Um, option, did was that option five? Okay, option six 
is to replace Orchard Drive Roundabout with the high intensity activated crosswalk Hawk system. Um, so re replace Orchard Drive. If warranted, install signal. If not, install a Hawk. Correct. Um, I think this is an easy one. Yes? Yeah. Yes? Yes? Council Member Blankley? I'm sorry, this is to... It's to install a signal, and if not warranted, to okay, install Okay, I'm a voting to save the million dollars. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what we just voted on. Okay. 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 Are you clear on that one? Yes. Okay. Um, so those are the six options. Now, we did have a speaker card that just showed up. Is that right? Uh, Beth Sullivan. Council, Mayor. My comment was going to be for the, um, which you voted against, building the drop-off zone, I believe. So it was going to be for that. My concern with the fence there, safety. With all the issues with things happening in schools, my issue is putting that fence. I've talked to a few people and they think it's a great idea to keep the fence. But for me, access to police and fire, that scares me. Because if you're across the street on the north side and you need to get across, yes, the fence keeps students, but it also keeps police and fire away from that, getting across the street if there's an emergency. Um, I'll say, I'll, I'll just, I don't need to make my other comments, but that was going to be my comment for that. Are you sure you, I mean, you have the time right now. Would you like um, to make I was just going to say, um, uh, Munoz, uh, yeah. Mr. <laughs> <laughs> um, the idea about my business is selling plants. I don't believe that plants need to be in the roundabouts that they design or in the, if they were to keep the, uh, oh, excuse me, the, um, I also asked about getting this microphone raised. <laughs> I went to City Hall and asked about this. Seeing people have to lean into this, I think they need to somehow get this raised up. But um, anyhow, I think visibility in roundabouts is important and something to look at in the future. Um, I come around the roundabout, um, this is getting a little off track again, on Luchessa, those trees in the center, you do come around and then you see the pedestrian crosswalk. I think it's unsafe to have these tall trees and shrubs in those areas. Keep things low so you can see visibly. Yes, you're going to be a little faster maybe, but you'll know that you're able to go faster and not see the pedestrians when you come around the corner. So that's my opinion. But Thank you so much for being sure. here. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so council, we went through all six. Staff, do you have any questions on that? Uh, and then just to remind the council then, um, if it's okay with the council, we'd like to come back uh, or ask staff to come back on February 13th to add the additional uh, study session item regarding uh, bond financing. Is that correct? All right. Anything else? Oh, my gosh. All right. Meeting adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.